Hello, um, I'm Professor Fiona McNichtus. I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist at Lucina Clinic, Crumlin Hospital in UCD. And I'm delighted to present to you today and help celebrate 30 years of research in St. John of God's. The topic today is overviewing research in the Lucina Clinic. I would like to remind everybody that Lucina has been providing clinical services for the last 65 years and geographically are currently located in five locations delivered by 10 consultants who lead multidisciplinary teams. I took up my position in Lucina in October 2001, 19 years ago, and this was the newly appointed academic consultant post that St. John of God's had, had uh, aligned with UCD and Crumlin Hospital to develop. And I think that's a testament of their uh, interest and support in research within child psychiatry. We know that child mental health difficulties are common, occurring in about 10% of our youth, that they are impairing, and longitudinal studies attest to the fact that they continue into adulthood. However, alongside that, we're aware that services have been typically under-resourced, underfunded, poorly coordinated, and disconnected. There is a research imperative to continue and ensure best use of scant resources and to develop and deliver evidence-based treatment delivered in a multidisciplinary fashion that support our young people and their families. We need to strive to continue to identify risk and protective factors for mental illness and aim for early intervention, which we know is cost-effective, not only in terms of monetary terms, but in terms of personal and quality of life for the young person. However, research must add to and not take away from clinical services or the burden of care to those delivering them. With that in mind, we started off in 2001, uh, establishing a Lucina Foundation with clinicians and with administrative support from the director at the time, uh, Mr. Paul Martin and Maria, Marie McCourt. The goal of the Lucina Foundation was to raise mental health awareness among public and professionals, to increase access to treatment, to ensure appropriate referrals to CAMS, and to offer clinical support training to multidisciplinary team members, primary care workers, GPs, and teachers. And all of this to be embedded in an environment that evaluated what we were doing and developed new research. Three main pillars. The psychoeducation was primarily uh, given by monthly parent evenings, uh, initially focused primarily on parents, but then increasingly attended by other professional groups. Um, the professional training was both uh, formal and informal, covering a broad range of topics and included academic pursuits like a diploma and a master's uh, run in UCD. And the last area was that of research, translational research, again, spanning a broad range of topics. But importantly, we wanted to ensure that it was widely disseminated amongst the public, as well as in typical uh, academic peer-reviewed journals. After the first four years of the foundation, we published a paper after having 5,000 parents attending, each attesting to the value of the uh, events. Uh, you can read there yourself the quotes that some of the parents left, where they emphasize not only the content of the presentation, but the fact that it was an opportunity for them during a coffee period to meet with other like-minded parents and receive support from them. We ensured that we had a multimedia dissemination program uh, expertly run by Marie McCourt, and this covered both print media, radio, television, along with publications in lay journals. And we uh, very much uh, uh, were lucky to receive the support of and collaborate with the various support organizations. Professional training was equally well received. Uh, we launched uh, the Department of Education sponsored a national rollout of teacher training over a two get day uh, event delivered by myself and Dr. Blonet Gavin and over thousands of teachers attended this over a number of years. We, every year we presented a workshop at the teachers organizations and we also wrote a book for teachers uh, on general mental health and selective mutism, which was sent to schools, free, all schools in Ireland free of charge. We focused with the GP, the College of GP and developed guidelines, contributed a module in child mental health 
and are currently updating the book on uh, child mental health. We worked with the HSE in de developing a programme for Programme for Action Children, um, which was also launched and delivered to primary care workers. And we have continued to provide significant training for our own CAMS uh, clinical team members. And we are delighted with the support that St. John of God have always given by way of facilitating attendance at these events. I want to move on and just touch briefly on a number of the specific research projects that we have been involved in. And I'm just going to mention a few. I mentioned in the beginning the fact that we are operating in a world, in fact, where resources are limited, but at the same time, demand is increasing. And it's so important to ensure that services are both effective and are meeting the needs of the users. There has been very little research of this uh, to date in Ireland, and we have just conducted a systematic review with Dr. Daniel Leahy, who was also a St. John of God uh, senior registrar uh, and in UCD. We identified in the uh, literature 15 studies that evaluated different components of CAMS uh, services um, in Ireland. And it's of interest to note that eight of these 15 were affiliated with St. John of God's. These included studies that looked at parents and young people's general satisfaction with CAMS, uh, the psychoeducational events and services for eating disorders. There were also two intervention studies that were published, one on a cognitive behavioral therapy group for the Friends program, and another was a waitlist initiative led by Joe McGarry, the two plus one initiative. In total, there were 280 parents and 146 youth that contributed to these uh, research studies. They included 171 health professionals, and there were 60 people included in the two RCTs conducted. The findings from all of them were, once a young person in the family accessed CAM services, they were generally positive with the experience. However, they did uh, mention the difficulties with long waiting lists, poor collaboration between professionals and between systems, and that limited their uh, experience of the service. The interventions that were studied were uh, effective, but however, we were aware that more robust methodology needs to uh, increase our ability uh, to evaluate the effectiveness of what's being offered in CAMS in general. I'm also aware that there are a number of other interventional studies that have been conducted in Nuchina that are either currently uh, going through publication or have been submitted. There were just some of the publications from the systematic review. Another uh, re uh, research program we developed in St. John of God's was that of eating disorders. And I don't need to remind you that uh, eating disorders is a serious mental illness that has the highest mortality rate. And it occurs in about 5% of young people. Uh, the prevalence is considered to be increasing and there is significant continuity. It occurs typically around the adolescent period but because that it continues, it goes into the young adult period, hence the importance of transition between services. The first study we conducted in 2009 was eating problems in children and adolescents in Ireland. And this was a very large methodologically robust two-stage study that included over 3000 secondary school children that were initially screened and subsequently had a semi-structured interview along with a certain number of their parents. The findings were that about 15% of uh, secondary school students had significant concerns on uh, the eating questionnaires and 1.2% would meet research, would meet clinical diagnosis. The eating concerns, the higher the difficulties there, it was linked with lower quality of life and poorer mental health in other areas. Both parents and youth viewed the media as having a very negative influence on them, and that correlated with the eating psychopathology. The second study, uh, Stigma and Treatment of Eating Disorders in Ireland, was conducted in 2015 and led by Dr. Leslie O'Hara. These were three separate studies, a mixed methodology. And again, we included secondary school students, health professionals, and qualitative interviews with young people with an eating disorder, their parents, and their healthcare provider. 
What we found was that there was significant public, personal and professional stigma linked to eating disorders. From the school survey, a third of young people expressed eating concerns, which was higher than our earlier study. And half of these had not divulged their concerns to anyone. And if asked, they were unlikely to seek professional services. The healthcare study of 171 health professionals, we established that they had less knowledge on eating disorders when compared to other mental health illnesses like depression or anxiety, or indeed medical conditions such as diabetes. And that there was a perception that they preferred and they viewed other colleagues as preferring to work with this cohort less than with those with other difficulties. There was a lack of an awareness between uh, families and uh, healthcare providers about what eating disorder services were in existence at that time. And there was a generally a negative perception of ineffectiveness and inadequacy. In the qualitative interview, we were very acutely aware of the high care burden to parents and they felt very much alone and isolated. We're currently um, running a specialist service in Lucina Clinic, uh, the FBT, family-based treatment service, alongside all the other CAMS eating disorder cases that come in. But this dedicated FBT team has been set up as part of the development of the National Clinical Programme for Eating Disorders and the rollout of FBT training. And I'm very lucky to be the consultant involved in that team, staffed by many expert and enthusiastic multidisciplinary team members. We have seen an increasing number of eating referrals um, over the last period of time. We haven't yet been established an eating disorder hub status and so do not have significant resources. However, alongside the translational research, we have developed a simple uh, model, which is the standardized integration of medical and psychiatry um, process in youth with eating disorders. And we run monthly clinics in Crumlin Hospital for those children that are most medically compromised. We're prioritizing ongoing clinical training for our staff and we're collaborating with BodyWise and the National Clinical Programme. We hope in next year that we will evaluate the simple model. And also we have some new specific research that has been planned. Uh, there's been a number of publications in the area of eating disorders. And I'd also like to mention that this uh, research has been replicated in a number of different studies. Uh, the insert there is of Dr. Yulia Zirinova, who is also a, Lu a Lucina senior registrar in her time and is now affiliated with St. John of God in Western Australia. For many children with mental health difficulties, they persist into adulthood and transition between child and adult services is very important. We know from international research that for many young people, this is poorly experienced and executed. And we were lucky enough in 2010 to receive HRB funding for a transition study, examining both policies across Ireland and from nine different CAMs taking a group of children who had reached the transition boundary and investigating their pathway. What we found was that there was gaps between policy and practice. And of the 62 youth that reached the transition boundary, although the majority were perceived by the clinician to have ongoing mental health needs, only a third of them were referred to adult services and of those a, fourth, a quarter refused. Certain disorders such as ADHD and eating disorders were least likely to be referred. And I think this is reflected in the national clinical uh, programs that have taken on board these areas and are trying to increase collaboration between services. The Milestone Project was a, an international European funded study and that looked at transition across Europe in eight different countries. It was a cohort study of over 700 young people from 39 different CAMs. And again, ongoing treatment was perceived by about 62% of clinicians. But what was interesting in that study that although about 50% of parents and young people felt that they also had ongoing mental health needs, it wasn't always the same group. The agreement between the two was only fair. And in fact, half of the children at the transition boundary were no longer meeting criteria for clinical concern. And this suggests in previous research on transition that the numbers of failed transitions might actually be an overestimate and is worthy of further study. 
the milestone uh, project also developed some um, transition specific tools that were designed to help practitioners consider transition at the transition boundary the need of the young person and this was the transition uh, outcome measure and the readiness measure and they were found within the RCT uh, to be effective. I'd like to end uh, by talking about occupational stress because we have become increasingly aware uh, that this is um, particularly affecting healthcare workers. Um, partly because of the excess workload, the emotionally charged environments we work in, and the fact that demand seems to continue to outstrip resources. Clinicians in psychiatry might be more at risk on account of the fact that not only have they to manage their own stress, but they have to manage that of their team members and treat other uh, patients who have mental health difficulties. And they're notorious for finding it difficult to ask for uh, help themselves. So within St. John of God in Uchina, we have conducted three cross-sectional studies using the Copenhagen burnout inventory as the main outcome measure. And these have been supported by the College of Psychiatry in Ireland and St. John of God's. The table here shows you the three studies. The first is in consultant uh, psychiatrists in the CAMS around Ireland. The second is in all staff, clinical and non-clinical within CAMS. And the third is within adult mental health services, again, all staff, and led by Dr. Larkin Feeney and Noella Broderick collecting the data. The response rate was about 50% in all of these studies. And what's concerning is that the group with the highest level of burnout was in the consultant CAMS group, where more than 70% of the group reported moderate or higher levels of burnout. Nearly all the group shared a low confidence in government commitment to investment in services and HSE effectively managing them. There was a sense of unrealistic and negative public perception and it was of interest that although this applied to uh, all services nationally, within the adult uh, mental health service of St. John of God, they did not feel this applied to their own services, suggesting there was more positive opinion of that. What was of concern was there was a significantly high job turnover intention in that nearly 50 to 70% of staff had felt in the last six to 12 months, they had seriously considered changing job. This was correlated with burnout levels and of equal concern was the fact that many of them would not choose to retrain or stay within mental health services. Within the adult uh, cohort examined, the non-clinical staff were most at risk, both of having higher burnover uh, scores, being least likely to want to stay working within the mental health services and expressing the highest degree of overcommitment. A thematic analysis from the free text questions highlighted three main areas of concerns. Uh, staff numbers and skill mix within their teams, funding issues, and that of public misunderstanding. It was a bit of a vicious circle we um, understood where unrealistic expectations of the adult or child in particular services led to inappropriate referrals. This increased the workload on CAM staff who either chose to take the referrals and were aware that they may not have the same effective treatments because it fell outside of the core remit of CAMS or they didn't accept the referrals. In both cases, both the referrer and the young person were increasingly dissatisfied. This further compounded clinician distress and demoralization leading to a risk of uh, occupational burnout leading to either presenteeism and risks involved in that or absenteeism. And of course, having fewer staff in the service led to further increased workload for those remaining. Uh, this taps into the burnout concepts of exhaustion, ineffectiveness and cynicism. And these were in fact, some of the factors in uh, the study that predicted burnout rates. What was also concerning is the fact that few staff members had prior or current burnout training, either in the professional training, on the job, or during the current pandemic. We're now 37 weeks into COVID-19, and we're at the second round of level five restrictions. We're aware that the impact of the pandemic is unprecedented, unrelenting, and potentially having devastating effects on the individual, family, and society. This is likely to place significant additional demands 
for mental health services and on mental health providers. And the three studies I've just shown you, which were pre-COVID, already shows to high stress levels within the working group. There is an urgent organizational um, intervention required, both generic for all staff members and specifically to those that are showing rates of significant stress. There's a need to monitor and evaluate this. And indeed, although we have had a lot of research within Lucina in the last 25 years, I believe there's an awful lot more to follow. Thank you very much. Great. So thank you very much for the invitation to speak about the National DBT project and allied interventions. So I'm going to present an overview of our research work on behalf of the team. So just want to acknowledge the work of the team. Daniel Flynn has been our overall project lead. Mary Joyce has been our project coordinator. And also just to acknowledge the many researchers who have contributed to aspects of this project. So just in terms of a little bit of background context uh, to our work, back in 2010, as a newly formed DBT team in North Lee Adult Mental Health Service in Cork, we were very keen to gather some outcome data. And at that time, the efficacy research on DBT was really impressive, but there really wasn't very much in terms of effectiveness research. So just looking at some of our data here, you can see we found very significant decreases across some key symptom outcome measures, including depression, hopelessness, suicidal ideation, borderline symptoms, and an increase in quality of life. We also looked at health service utilization data. And here you can see, we saw quite pronounced decreases in emergency department visits, and also in terms of hospital admissions. We then used this data to make the case for expanding DBT across Cork, and three further DBT teams were established. We then expanded the research to include these new DBT teams, and the research continued to show significant decreases across key symptom outcome measures. And I guess what this told us was that DBT could be effective in very routine clinical settings in routine adult mental health services within Ireland. So, then in 2013, Daniel Flynn developed a proposal to coordinate a national implementation of DBT. And this initial proposal aimed to train 16 teams in DBT over two years. And we had three main research aims to this project. The first was to evaluate the effectiveness of DBT for clients who participated in programs established as part of the National DBT project. And to this end, we looked at data from our adult mental health teams. And in particular, we have data on 196 adult participants across nine teams. And we saw significant decreases on all key symptom outcome measures, including frequency of self-harm. Then to turn our attention to the CAMS data, we have data on 84 participants across seven teams. And again, we saw very significant decreases on the key symptom outcome measures. And we also saw a significant decrease in terms of health service utilization. So they had decreased numbers of inpatient admissions and visits to the emergency department. And then the second aim of our research evaluation was to evaluate the coordinated implementation of DBT. So to this end, we conducted interviews with the DBT team leaders, and we also invited all DBT therapists to complete surveys so that we could gather an understanding of their experience of being part of this project. And I know Clotha is going to speak in more detail about the experience of her and our colleagues being part of this study in a few minutes. Then the third aim was to evaluate the economic effectiveness of the project. And we did this in conjunction with some health economists. So what we found was that DBT was more effective and less expensive than no DBT. And thus we considered it to be cost effective. So here we see an overview of all the DBT teams in Ireland. So the ones with the tick are the ones who existed prior to the National DBT project. And you can also see each of the teams who trained as part of years one, two and three of the project. 
So our research team has also been involved in a number of allied projects. So these allied projects have fallen under the categories of systemic interventions as an adjunct to DBT and also adaptations of DBT skills training itself. So just firstly, in terms of the systemic interventions as adjuncts, we have conducted some research on family connections and also on clinician connections. So in terms of family connections, it's a multi-family group intervention for family members and loved ones of those with BPD. It was developed by Alan Frazzetti and Perry Hoffman. It's based on both DBT and stress coping and adaptation theory. And in our research, we found that family connections was more effective than an optimized treatment as usual condition with our family connections participants experiencing decreases in burden and also in grief. Then clinician connections is an adaptation of family connections and it's essentially a brief training program for clinicians who work in some capacity with individuals with BPD but don't have formal training in DBT and in our research to date on the clinician connections program so we have looked at qualitatively at themes which have emerged from focus groups with practitioners who have taken part in the Clinician Connections programme and our quantitative evaluation of Clinician Connections is currently underway. So we have also looked at adaptations of DBT skills training. So we have evaluated the DBT skills only group called You and Me or Understanding and Managing Emotions and this program has been aimed at individuals with emotion dysregulation, but who aren't actively engaging in self-harm. And we have found this to be very effective for this client group. Some of my colleagues have also been involved in the evaluation of the UME-A program for individuals who have emotion dysregulation, but a dual diagnosis and would present with addiction difficulties also. And Finally, some other colleagues on our team have been involved in a project called DBT Steps A, which is a universal levels DBT skills training program for adolescents and is delivered within the secondary school system. So that's really just a very quick overview of some of the projects which we have been involved in. And we look forward to speaking in more detail about some of these in due course. So just a very quick overview of where we're at. So as you've seen, between 2010 and 2012, we were very much involved in local pilot work within Cork. Then from 2013 to 2017 was the active phase of the National DBT project. And since 2018, I guess we have been reflecting, writing up the research and working on the publications and considering what the next steps are. So at the moment, we're in the process of changing our training model and we're moving to a train the trainer model, which we're hoping will commence in January 2021. We will, of course, be looking at some research based on this new training model. And again, we look forward to presenting on this in due course in the future. So that's just our very quick overview. So now I'll hand over to Cloda. So hi, everyone. Um, I'm here to present on DBT in Lucina. Um, so my name is Claude Denis Vuelon. I'm a senior clinical psychologist in Lucina CAMS and the coordinator of the DBT programme here. Um, so I trained in DBT in 2015 as part of the national training programme, um, which was rolled out to address suicidal behaviour in Ireland. So I'm going to give you a brief overview of our DBT programme in Lucina CAMS, and then we can hear quotes from some of the young people who've completed the programme. So we have, sorry, I'm change slides. Um, we have two DBT teams um, in Lucina CAMS and 15 DBT therapists. Um, and one of our challenges has been to keep our teams staffed so that we can offer DBT to all of the young people attending um, Lucina CAMS. Um, so these two teams serve as nine multidisciplinary teams. And we have delivered DBT to young people and their families across South County Dublin since 2015. So to date, we have um, offered comprehensive DBT to a total of 127 young people and their families attending Lucina CAMS. 85 young people have completed the DBT programme and 42 families either declined the offer of DBT or commenced it and could not complete the full programme. 
And DBTA for adolescents is slightly different to the um, DBT offered to adults. It la it's a six month program um, and it also involves a parent attending um, skills training with the young person. So it's a big commitment for families to make. They're attending Lucina for three hours a week at least. Um, and that is in line with the severity of the problems that the young people. I asked young people to take part in a series of interviews and discuss their experience of DBT in their own words. Um, six young people who had, take, who had completed comprehensive DBT opted to take part. The next couple of slides contain quotes from one of these young people outlining his experiences and understanding of DBT. He is a particularly articulate young person whose quotes are indicative of the experiences that all the young people who took part referenced. So I've changed his name to protect his identity. And my computer is frozen. Okay, the next slide. So, um, DBT are kind of rewiring the ways of thinking that you've got into your head that aren't helping. So before I wouldn't have noticed these things and I would have thought, oh, I don't know why I'm feeling this way and I don't know how to stop it. So things just got worse and worse. But now I know when something's going wrong and the things that I need to look out for. Yeah. And I think it just reminds you of the ways of thinking that most people have because nobody talks about these ways of thinking anywhere else. Nobody talks about how you deal with those specific issues. So it helps you learn that. You know what I mean? And then continuing on on his perception of DBT. Yeah, for sure. It's given me just a focus in terms of where I'm going and understanding of what I'm going through. Just because I feel like before my mental health, it was just like just this thing that was there. Now I know what it is and I know what's going on and I know where I want to be and how to get there. And I just have a better understanding, not only of my mental health and therapy, but also just life and how to deal with it. Yeah. So all of the young people who took part in the interviews referred to developing insight into themselves and their goals. They expressed strong change narratives and referred to DBT as an agent of positive change in their lives. Ben described feeling empowered over his own narrative, his choices and his mental health problems. Again, this experience was shared among the other young people who took part in the interviews. Thank you so much. Okay, so welcome, uh, Kevin and Shane. We're celebrating our 30th Research Study Day. And Shane, I'll start with you first. As Director of Community Mental Health Services, can you tell us about some of the developments you've witnessed over that time? Okay, well, first, uh, I don't know where the time went, uh, but it came and went. I suppose the, the largest overall changes have been in the areas of multidisciplinary team working. Uh, and I include administrative staff in that. Uh, early intervention has also been huge as has programme development. There was major change brought about by uh, improved efficacy of medication uh, and medicines, which basically allowed other interventions to be much more effective. No longer do we talk about controlling symptoms, but also measures that improve quality of life for sufferers and also the wider family's involvement in contrib contributing to what we now call recovery and helping bring about uh, major improvements. So a greater understanding also contributes massively to the destigmatization of mental health and general well-being. I believe that St. John o God basically led the way in research and evidence-based best practice in developing all sorts of educational programs. That would be the biggest change for me. Great. Thanks very much, Shane. And um, it's it's great to hear your insights on that and now to be able to welcome Kevin to the discussion. And Kevin, Shane's talked about building that evidence base over the last 30 years. And now you're going to talk us through some of the major innovations that have, have happened in Lucina Camps through that time. Okay, so in 2020, we launched a new program called the Junior Reach Program in the Lucina Child and Adolescent Mental Health Services. Um, the Junior Reach Programme is a programme for young people who, between the age of 12 and 15 years of age who have disengaged from school 
for reasons uh, owing to mental health difficulties such as anxiety, um, depression, social phobia, etc. This came about um, through allegiances with local stakeholders in the community, with the education training board, with the local with the local SIPSIs, and the national education and psychologists working in the community. And also by reviewing the literature, we were able to see that there was nothing out there for this group of young people to help them get back into the school uh, into the school cycle. So we set up a programme which is basically a mixture of mental health professionals and educators working together to find solutions to help people get back into the get back into the classroom. And we set up in March 2020 and we've been running very successfully since then. And we and thanks to the St. John God Research Foundation, we are currently evaluating the programme and looking to see what the outcomes are in relation to school return. Fantastic. And, and the next um, uh, innovation building on from that and building on from another success in our mental health services is the Early Psychosis Programme. So early intervention and psychosis has been a real team for the St. John and Gold Community Mental Health Services going back to the mid-1990s um, when the Dublin first episode psychosis study looked at the outcomes for people developing a psychosis for the first time. And that continues to be measured and has produced the DTEC program, um, which which intervenes in early psychosis within a very short period of time. The area that hasn't been developed in Ireland yet is early intervention in the prodrome of psychosis, the period of time that occurs before the first psychotic symptom. Time when young people start to um, deteriorate in their ability to socialise with their friends, where they're not um, achieving as well as they might normally be in school and the family have noticed that some changes have occurred. That's known as the prodromal period of psychosis and there's a lot of interest internationally in that period because recent research has shown that if you intervene in that period of time you can stave off the possibility of a person developing a psychosis. And even if they do develop psychosis later on, the outcomes will be much better if they get treatment at an early stage. So we are, within the St. John Gold Community Mental Health Services, we are currently working at how to develop a prodromal programme within our Regina CAMS. And we've been linking in with a number of stakeholders, both in the HSC and within the Health Research Board, to explore how we might best do that. Okay, so it's great to see another initiative following the steps really of the DETECT service, which has been a real exemplar of excellent research practice, but also service delivery within the St. John of God, God organization. The, the next program you're going to talk to us about is going to be very interesting and of relevance to a lot of CAM services around the country. And this is involving the assessment and treatment of ADHD. Okay, so attention deficit hyperactive disorder is a very common condition amongst um, young people and most um, services would have very busy ADHD clinics um, running, within their, running within their service. The assessment process for ADHD usually involves intensive clinical interview, collateral from family, Collateral, um, collateral from school. And they're all very subjective measures of um, very subjective measures of symptoms. But over the last number of years, there is a new objective measure, the QB test, which is basically a small computer where the young person um, puts on straps on their legs and a pad on their forehead and they play a computer game for about 30 minutes. And during that time, there's an objective measurement of impulsivity and attention. And whilst it's not a replacement um, for, it's not a replacement for the usual um, assessment, 
it greatly reduces the amount of time um, and burden on the young person and their family mm -hmm. during that period of time and the efficacy and reliability and validity of the QP test is really, really very strong. So in the Lucina um, clinic, we have introduced QB tests amongst three of our clinics. We're currently looking at installing two more in our remaining two clinics. We were the first um, clinic in CAM in Ireland to bring this to Ireland. Um, and we have seen really, really um, positive benefits um, for young people who attend or for young people who are dental services. It's not just used in the diagnostic process, it's also used in the titration and monitoring of medication as a young person is started on um, imminent medication for ADHD. It's often very difficult to get the right dose and the right medication, mm -hmm. so this is really, really helpful in being, in being more accurate in, in, in um, prescribing the treatment. Mm -hmm. In the ADHD clinics, um, we have also been the first uh, CAMS clinics in the country to introduce nurse prescribing for ADHD. About four years ago in 2015, um, we held a conference in collaboration with UCD and brought over nurse prescribers from the UK. Um, Stimulant medication was not available um, for, for the treatment of ADHD, but we worked with we worked with UCD, we worked with the Nurse and Midwifery Professional Development Unit and brought it to government um, along with other CHOs and got um, stimulant medication made available for the treatment of ADHD, which has been a really, really important breakthrough because it means that our nursing staff are able to, our nursing staff are able to provide very comprehensive assessments um, to young people and develop really strong therapeutic alliances and be the person who prescribes the medications mm -hmm. as well. One of our big developments within the last couple of months is we've had um, an advanced nurse practitioner in one of our clinics who, um, her role is now is, is to standardise um, ADHD treatments across all of our Lucina clinics. Fantastic. Some great developments. Do you see the likes of that assessment tool for ADHD being made available in mainstream or, or widespread throughout the country? Well, uh, actually, in the NHS, um, they, are, they are rolling it out across every trust. And we would hope that that would happen as well. In we would hope that that would happen as well in Ireland. Funding would be made available for that. Great. So there's great things happening. There's a great legacy of innovation there as well. And thanks to you both for speaking about it today. I know it's a rapid fire tour of innovation in the services, and uh, it's just a taster for our audience. I'm sure there's going to be people interested in hearing more. And um, everybody is welcome to get in touch with yourselves through us in the Research Foundation. Uh, I should also mention, Shane, you'll be joining the live panel at the end of today's session. I'm looking thanks forward very to much. It. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.